Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the first Teaching Nano and Emerging Technologies webinar, and I'm Quinn Spadola. I am the AAAS Science and Technology Policy in the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office, and our office is helping to facilitate the Teaching Nano and Emerging Technologies Network. So I just want to give you a little bit about the network and the webinar before we begin. The purpose of the network is to bring together educators so you guys can talk to each other and share best practices, what works, what doesn't work, what are good resources, good activities and examples, and learn from each other. And if you have any questions about the network or are interested in joining, feel free to email nanoed at nnco.nano.gov. That's nanoed at nnco.nano.gov. And I'll have that email up again at the end of the webinar on a slide. And these webinars that are being hosted by the network are supposed to be an opportunity for teachers to get a more in-depth look at a particular resource or a curriculum, and also to give feedback and suggestions. So tonight, definitely ask questions and send your comments. Um, if you're logged into Google, you should be able to see a question and answer panel off to the right of the display where you can post your questions. If you don't want to log into Google, that's fine. Just email your questions to nanoed at nnco.nano.gov. Um, so for tonight's webinar, the format will be uh, about a 40-minute presentation given by Marielle, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers and comments and feedback. So um, this evening, as I said, the webinar is Teaching Nanoscale Science and Engineering, a presentation for middle and high school teachers. And it's being presented by Marielle Kolker. Uh, she will be discussing a course that she helped co-develop, Nanoscale Science and Engineering. And she teaches it at Morristown High School. As mentioned in the webinar flyer, Marielle has 16 years of teaching experience. She's also a master teacher for Project Lead the Way and an advocate for gender equity in STEM. She teaches physics, engineering, and nanoscience and came to teaching after working as a mechanical engineer with Con Edison for 11 years. So now I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to Marielle so she can give her presentation. Thank you. All right, hello everyone and thank you. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen with you so that you can um, follow along with the presentation with me. Um, again, my name is Marielle Kolker. I am um, a mechanical engineer um, and I'm a Project Lead the Way master teacher um, and I'm going to share with you just my version of the nanoscience course that I authored and teach at Morristown High School. Um, uh, this is not the definitive answer to how a nanoscience class should be taught. This is my version and I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and your suggestions for improvements at the end. Okay, so the reason why um, this course is being taught and my purpose for putting it together was to grow the number of students pursuing STEM. Uh, it, nanoscience can be so dynamic and interesting and um, so futuristic that uh, it actually serves as a good vector for attracting students and getting them excited about science. So. My course is project-based, so the kids are very active. Um, it's student-driven, um, and it's research and application-focused. So what we do is I present to them some of the core ideas in nanoscience. They do research about it. They find out about it. And then um, we move th through explanation to um, what are the applications. Uh, the students have to recall, apply, and synthesize knowledge from chemistry and biology in particular. And, um, and I find that this is a good thing because um, as a physics teacher, they do seem to, work, to understand everything by the time they graduate, but I can say that um, having um, students who just have just finished chemistry, um, the recall is not as good as I thought it would be. And uh, we all know from understanding how people learn that being um, caused, being asked to recall information and to, and to synthesize it is actually something that will cement that knowledge um, in one's um, mind. And so this is actually a very nice capstone course. Um, I, but we allow it as um, 10th grade and beyond because they take chemistry in 10th grade and we want to make sure that they're at least, uh, co it's a co-requisite with chemistry. 
So and it um, because I run it as an um, engineering design process throughout the course, uh, it actually addresses more um, next gen science standards than my physics class or the chemistry or biology classes that are run um, in the high school. So it's definitely going in the direction of the future of science education. So the thing about nanotechnology that most of you may know is that it fuses chemistry, physics, and biology and combines it with engineering, economics, social and ethical implications. Um, and um, this is one of the theories for why it took so long for nanoscience to become um, uh, present in the in our in our discussions and in our research labs because you know um, we tend to put these sciences into silos and certainly in high school and in, in education um, students always believe that they all of their classes are independent of one another and one of the strengths and one of the beauties of this is that it combines all of these these theory these all these fields um, and so it makes it more interesting um, my class includes a project-based learning unit, which I'll talk about later, and um, it's definitely career-focused. And um, as you'll see, there there's a large demand for um, students that are perhaps not going on to be PhD researchers, but um, that will, in some way or another, work in the nano in a nanoscience affected field. Um, and um, so there are many, many jobs available, and that's one of the reasons why we're teaching it. And um, one of the things that makes it easy to teach is that I don't have to create any, I have created a couple of labs for the class, but for the most part I use lessons that are posted online that are free for use. Um, they're NSF funded and they're provided, um, you know, in conjunction with um, either universities or consortiums of universities and they're, they're vetted and they're wonderful. So there's a tremendous um, trove of, of laboratory um, research to or excuse me uh, lessons that we can choose from so why teach nano well it's the future it's the future of science it's the future of engineering um, what I have up here are um, the Nobel Prize research in both chemistry and physics in 2014 both in nanoscience in chemistry it was uh, for super resolved fluorescence microscopy which is on the left in which um, biologists can now um, cause cells to fluoresce and then watch them with an optical, a super resolved optical microscope and actually in vitro watch, um, observe them while they are alive and they are, um, they are uh, doing their thing and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a revolution um, because if you, if you go to something such as a, a, a scanning electron microscope only things that are no longer living can be used in that type of environment. So this is an innovation. And then on the right you see the physics Nobel Prize was given to the developer of the blue LED and when that happened and became um, adopted into industry um, that's when our cell phones all went from flip phones you know with the, with the black and white or the black and gray computers um, like a calcula calculator screen to these like little televisions that we carry around in our pockets with us. So um, it's really truly everywhere, and I will also say that if you go, you know, I've been to the Rutgers um, University College of Engineering um, campus, and if you walk into the aerospace lab, the research that they're doing is in nanoscience because it's in uh, nanomaterials that are used for um, for aerospace uh, research. So te nanotechnology is everywhere, and um, I'm sure, as you all aware, it's it's between um, you know medical and biology and biosystems, sustainable energy, uh, materials, uh, environments, fuels, computers. Um, it really affects every aspect of our society, and um, it's very big business. Um, nanotechnology are estimated to have impacted 2.4 trillion dollars to date. And uh, the the nanotechno nanotechnology initiative is um, what the where the U.S. government has put all of its resources, and that's been around since 2001. So um, I found this on the nano.gov website. We um, expect that by 2020, six million nanotechnology workers will be needed, and two million of them will be in the United States. So as we see some areas of industry dying, um, like the coal industry. Um, 
we have other areas that are growing and this is one of them and so we need an educated workforce one that is conversant in um, these types of technologies and um, so that's what as high school and middle school teachers that's what we are um, that's what our job is is to, is to create um, the workforce and uh, get them excited and, and prepared to handle nanotechnology so very briefly, just for anyone who anyone who may not know what a nano um, nanometer is, nano is one billionth. So a nanometer is one billionth of a meter, and that's easy to say but hard to understand. So if you think about a DNA, which we're, of which we are all familiar, um, uh, DNA is two nanometers wide. Again, though, that's a little hard because you know what is a, what is how big is DNA? While we're talking about DNA, I just want to throw this in there. The discoverer of the double helix was were not Watson and Crick. It was Rosalind Franklin with her um, extra diffraction images of DNA. And they wrote the paper and got the uh, Nobel Prize for it. So anyway, how small is nano? This is my favorite way of thinking about it. If you take a penny, one of the pennies that has the Lincoln Memorial on the back, and if you look in really closely, many people don't even know this, but um, but uh, in the center of that, you can actually see a tiny um, picture of uh, Lincoln, the Lincoln actual memorial itself, the uh, the statue of Lincoln. And what we're looking at is um, him sitting in his chair. Now, if you zoom into that, if you can imagine zooming into that to um, to hit one of his eyelashes, one of uh, his eyelashes would be ten thousand nanometers wide. So that gives you an idea of just how small we're talking. So what makes nanoscience different? Uh, molecules and materials behave differently at the, nano, at the nanoscale. Gravity is irrelevant um, because um, inertial forces no longer tend to matter. So what happens is um, intermolecular forces dominate at the nanoscale. Um, viscosity changes mobility. That idea that we can shrink um, a little spaceship or a school bus down to the size of a red blood cell and inject it into someone's um, body doesn't, doesn't hold up when you understand the physics of viscosity. Um, you have to work differently in order to be mobile at the nano level. Uh, area and volume ratio, area to volume ratio changes the way materials operate, and quantum effects dominate. So we see things like quantum computers being very different from uh, regular um, binary computers. So at the nano scale, properties are size dependent. So we can tune these particularly when it comes to optical, mechanical, and chemical properties, um, just by changing the size of the particle. So fluorescence color, we have something called quantum dots. This, the size of the particle dictates its fluorescence color, and this can be this is used in medicine and other applications. Um, you can we can tune the size of a nano ceramic to um, attract bone cells, and um, we know and we have known for a while that smaller particles. Uh, make better catalysts and improve absorption. So when I first started on my journey to, to discover how I was going to teach this in an appropriate way, I, just, I tripped a, across the big ideas of nanoscale science and engineering. So these nine ideas were developed, um, they're, they're in this book from, by the NSDA Press, and they're developed by scientists and science educators. Uh, there were actually two nano NSF funded workshops in 2006 and 2007 and so it was science and science educators they came together and they decided for both the K-12 to level and then again for the I guess 13 to 17 level um, what the big ideas were that we wanted to teach and so this is where I took my inspiration for what I was going to teach and how I was going to categorize it. Um, my categorizations are slightly different but uh, I touch on all of these areas. So. Um, when I have here MHS, nanoscale science and engineering, I'm talking about Morristown High School. So this is my version. So um, I, we start with size and scale. Um, if you've all seen the video Powers of Ten by Charles and Ray Ames, um, we do a series of activities um, and experiments in which uh, the kids get to really assess how big um, one billionth of a meter is because it's such a hard thing to get your head around. Um, we talk about and we, they write essays on um, Richard Feynman's speech. Uh, there's plenty of room at the bottom. 
and uh, we talk about the history of nanoscience and where it where it comes from. Um, we do a small unit on quantum effects, and um, in particular, quantum computing, which is actually turning into a hot, you know, news item. Um, we talk about Moore's law and the fact that uh, uh, Moore predicted. Um, at the beginning of the transistor um, solid state revolution that the number of transistors uh, in a computer would decrease um, every by half every year or every two years and what happened was that wound up either as a predictor or not it wound up being true and um, we've got to the limit of Moore's law where we can no longer get smaller because we get to this the point where you know we have a, a, a wire inside a transistor that is 10 nanometers wide um, quantum quantum behavior is predominant and so electrons no longer stay in the wire so quantum computing is a new way of um, of looking at how computers can work uh, qubits are the things that are used and they're very interesting because um, there's no longer a one and a zero for every um, two you have um, two to the square for every number of um, qubits you have you have two to the for n number you have two to the n um, number of operations that can happen so it's actually exponentially larger um, and so good for certain kinds of operations um, so they learn about quantum computing which is um, kind of a fun activity and something that kind of stretches their brain a little bit. Scanning and tunnel, scanning tunneling microscopy is one of the tools of the nano, nanoscale and it actually employs quantum effects and so that's something else that we explore to help them understand quantum. But quantum is something that's hard, it's hard to teach and, and as um, Niels Bohr said, anyone um, who, uh, well, he's, anyone that uh, says that they understand quantum effects doesn't understand it. Um, we explore size, the, the majority of the year is spent on size dependent properties and forces and interactions. So um, surface area to volume ratio, there are lots of little um, activities and experiments in which they get to explore that and to really come to understand how um, as things get very small and they approach the nanoscale, surface area becomes proportionately larger, um, much larger uh, as compared to volume and um, and this affects the way chemically um, materials will behave. Um, we also do the exploration into viscosity, air resistance and mobility at the nanoscale and we also talk about light matter interaction and we actually create gold nanoparticles and silver nanoparticles in the lab and you know with gold nanoparticles um, that's a favorite um, lab because not only is it it's very simple and it's very obvious that gold uh, turns red and turns blue um, and it's uh, the reason why stained glass is the colors that it is, gold and silver. Um, but also the medical applications of, of gold nanoparticles are um, so fascinating. Gold can be, it, it is actually in, in an experimental sense, it's um, used to target tumors and because it is a metal uh, it can be injected into the body it is biocompatible and when it uh, goes and atta attaches to a tumor it attracts the tumors attract them and when they attach to a tumor um, simple um, infrared radiation or perhaps maybe microscope um, excuse me uh, microwave radiation can heat up the gold particles and actually burn and kill the tumor cells. So um, students are fascinated by that, and that is actually a, a nice unit that we work that I that we um, include. Um, with regard to forces and interactions, that whole the, the hierarchy of intermolecular forces, what is um, stronger, and the fact that gravity no longer comes into play um, is something that we explore. Um, we do a unit with colloid solutions and suspensions. And you know, I don't know that chemistry teachers actually involve this. They might, they might not, but um, that's all based on the nanoscale. Um, solutions are um, smaller than a nanometer or 10 nanometers. Colloids are 10 to 100 nanometers and then suspensions are um, larger than 100 nanometers. Um, hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties and the fact that um, that uh, the polarity dictates how plants repel water 
and then all of the applications of hydrophobicity is a complete and utter fascination um, by my students. They absolutely, they absolutely love that. Um, we do a unit on polymer and material science. So um, I, I teach them about polymers, um, both synthetic and natural polymers. We um, do um, an engineering design process unit for um, materials design, which is with polymer cross-linking. Um, they investigate the different types of nanocomposites. Um, they do use actual research data from Stevens Institute of Technology, where I actually worked in the soft materials lab. Um, so I've got some TGA data that they actually analyze to tell um, actually the density of the grafting density of polymer on iron oxide nanoparticles. So that's the TGA. There's also FTIR, infrared spectroscopy data, and TEM data that um, I expose them to. Um, so that's real, you know, university level research, which is good for a good exposure for them. Um, we talk about DNA origami and the fact that um, it is a uh, a, a fascinating, this is, you know, natural polymers and all the ways in which DNA is being utilized in order to um, target uh, drug delivery in, say, cancer patients. Um, and the fact that DNA is the easiest to work with, it's completely biocompatible, we understand it very well, and, um, and uh, it's, it's the cutting edge of bio-nano engineering. Um, I do a whole unit on carbon allotropes. Uh, it falls into the structure of matter category, but carbon is just amazing. So uh, we talk about graphene, carbon nanotubes, single wall carbon nanotubes, multiple wall carbon nanotubes, and buckyballs or fullerenes. Um, so in at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through um, this unit uh, and just kind of give you a, a like a little snapshot of what happens during the class. What we have in this unit is student-driven research, so they actually research, I don't teach this, they research it and then they present it back to me and in doing so um, they're, it's student-centered but they're still, you know, it's their, their information is vetted by me and, and we and they wind up getting a good big picture of um, the way that these um, allotropes are being used in nanotechnology right now. Um, they present it to me, then um, we do a hands-on experiment which is actually an engineering design process where they're optimizing um, graphite fibers um, and then uh, I take them through an application which is um, a fun side detour but it's also uh, completely relevant to them understanding the applications of electron organic electronics and how graphene fits into that. So um, with that, I'll show you what this actual little unit looks like. So here's a slide that they created um, from the presentation from the presentation on um, graphene well, on all the allotropes. So they do this presentation. They they do the research. They present it um, to the class so that everyone gets a large scale picture. Then um, this is in Canvas, our learning management system. This is their materials engineering design challenge. So um, they have got fibers that they're making with sodium alginate, and they are optimizing them um, to make them as conductive as possible. Um, so they have to then they have to document all of this, the goal, what the um, optimizations are, what are the constraints, um, their measurements, they have to put photo, photos of everything in, they have to provide um, evidence of their calculations, and then they have to summarize. Um, and there are about eight points in the summary statement that they summarize. So this is the type of, this is actually um, um, a, an SEM photo of a graphene oxide Nano, um, it's not a nanofiber, it's a fiber, but it's, um, it's a graphene oxide um, fiber that was developed at Rutgers University in their lab um, and uh, when I was working there last summer. And um, what it is is graphene sheets that are connected um, with calcium because the graphene is actually extruded into a calcium ion bath. And they're connected it they're, they're connected via with calcium so that they can actually be conductive and what the optimization is is to find um, with graphene oxide a way of producing on a on a reasonable level 
these um, graphene fibers um, that can be used for um, textiles and um, electronics, organic electronics. So this is graphite, graphene oxide. Um, the students were making graphite fibers using the same method that these researchers used to create the conductive graphene fibers in the lab. So they're using graphene, we're using graphite. Graphite is pencil, dust, um, and um, they put it in sodium alginate, which is actually the thing that cross-links. And we had, of course, done the cross-linking lab already. Um, so, uh, but they were contesting for conductivity. So it was really an identical method, um, for the most part, to what was going on in the lab. So here are some of my students, and here is their, um, uh, you can see the fiber in her hands um, that, she, that she created. Um, here's a student measuring the width of the, um, of the fiber next to a ruler under a microscope. Um, here's the resistance being calculated, and here you can see that they've, they've got all of the dimensions, and then they calculate resistivity. And um, this is, the, this is then um, the connection to nanoscience. Graphene is transparent, highly conductive, stronger than steel, flexible, and biocompatible. So this is the application. So helping them understand how, how the, the research in the lab, which they've just mimicked on a, they've just modeled, um, goes into the applications of, for the future. So um, the Pro Project Jacquard, if you're familiar with it, is the thing that, um, that the Rutgers PhDs are actually trying are supporting um, in their research. So this is actually the application, and this is a, a fabulous connection to this for the students to be able to see what's coming. Um, so what we do is I, I give them this presentation. Um, we walk them through all the ways in which graphene is going to change the way electronics and you know, organic electronics um, and what it's going to do for us. Um, and then um, I actually applied for and received a grant um, to uh, do e-textiles and organic, not organic, this is not organic, but it's, um, it's soft circuitry. So these are the components um, which we received in the mail. These are LEDs, um, conductive fiber, um, batteries, battery packs, um, programmable chips, and switches. So I then went on to teach them circuit basics um, with the LEDs and parallel circuits. I taught them to sew because really no one knew how to sew. And um, they did circuit design. And they had, um, they had uh, circuits that lit up um, on clothing. Or These were the first attempts. Um, but it was, very, it was exciting for them. And it was a nice soup to nuts kind of unit in which they saw from the pure theory all the way through to the application. So um, after that, we worked on social and ethical implications, um, which was really role play, which was interesting. Um, they, this is something that they absolutely love, and I think I could expand on next year. Um, you know, the, the implications when it comes to privacy, medical implications, cultural, economic, military. Um, it, was, it, it produced a tremendous amount of very interesting uh, conversation in the class. In fact, I might have done this at the beginning of the year because it really brought the, it was such a good way for the kids to get to know each other. I'm also in the process of reading Prey by Michael Crichton, which is Swarm Technology, and uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to incorporate that into the class as well because I like the idea of a science class in which you have to read a, um, a science fiction book. I think that's interesting. So um, in addition to all of these structured units, I also included project-based learning into the class. So the essential question with project-based learning that I posed to them was, how can we grow awareness of nanotechnology and its possibilities so that we can excite a generation of students about STEM? And what they decided to do was take their information, their knowledge about nanoscience, and bring it to a local museum and host a series of um, uh, demonstrations and exhibits on nanoscience for very young children that come through for Super Science Saturdays. So what we have, um, so what we did was, the students did, they, the, the benefits of project-based learning are they research, they plan, they develop the exhibits on their own. I did not give them any ideas, I did not tell them what to do. They range from Brownian in motion using hex bugs, um, they did uh, hydrophobicity, which is a unending 
fascination, everyone has an unending fascination with that. Um, we, um, they worked with, um, they had mag magnetic ferrofluid, um, they had um, gold nanoparticles, uh, they had all kinds of things that they, that they came up with on their own. And every and in each year, they come up with different sets of things, and I just support them. Uh, so they had to communicate with the museum, communicate with administration within the school system, apply for a grant, grant, fundraise, budget, purchase, write press releases, write articles, create a website, schedule. They had to manage their schedule with real deadlines, and they interacted with the public on a series of Saturdays. And this was all on their own time and they were all happy to, it was astonishing how enthusiastic and excited they got about this. And my thought about this and the reason why I included this um, in this class is because um, for me the ultimate proof of their, um, the success of this class is whether or not they can explain nanoscience to not only somebody who's not in the class but ch to children because that's the hardest explanation you know, to explain it to someone who's five or six and um, they came away with such confidence in their knowledge. So um, this uh, I put together um, as a lighthearted look at what some of the challenges are to teaching nanoscience in the, in the um, in the classroom. So uh, one of the hardest, one of the, the biggest issues is that nanotechnology is so new that there's no ability for teachers or students to be an expert. So uh, the first thing as a teacher to know is that you will not have all the answers. There is no textbook. There is no definitive way of knowing what all the answers are. But um, my answer to that is new is exciting. Students actually love the fact that I'm learning the same thing that they're learning at the same time. Um, that it's uh, that it's something that we come come upon together, and that it's that it's uh, um, they they find articles, they find um, information and news, and they send it to me. Mrs. Coker, look what I found. They are very that's very exciting to them. They really enjoy that. Um, current events are part of the course. Excuse me. Current events are part of the course, um, so this is something that I'm going to do in future years. I'm actually going to take um, the uh, current make current events a um, a requirement in future years, and get the um, uh, get have the students take uh, on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, and um, get the get them to come into the classroom and report on a regular basis even when they're at the beginning of the year and they don't really understand the nano science yet um, I think this is a good way to introduce and I think that's what I'm going to do going forward um, now this is what you deal with when you when you have nano science ancient history is 1989 so if you all are aware these are the xenon atoms that are um, um, the IBM workers placed with an the precursor to the um, atomic force microscope on a bed of um, on a bed of, uh, of sapphire. So this is forever ago, and that's honestly that's ancient history for students as well. So it's um, it's absolutely perfect that uh, that it's completely as old as they are. Um, what are the challenges of teaching nano? There are no textbooks available, so that's actually a problem. Um, but um, what that what it winds up happening is that um, what I wind up doing is um, I say to them that's fine. We don't like textbooks. Who cares? They don't they don't want a textbook either, and as much as I do. Um, they learn from YouTube, from TED, from LinkedIn. Um, there are a tremendous number of um, fabulous. Uh, um, slide presentations, slide shares on LinkedIn by um, researchers um, at university level, and I've used several of them in the classroom. Um, articles from the New York Times, articles on nano work, there are a tremendous number of um, resources that are, that are out there, and they're current. And um, this also requires students to do authentic research and to validate their sources, which is something that is absolutely, absolutely um, uh, essential to their college and career readiness, which is part of what we're trying to prepare them for. 
So, you know, when you don't have a textbook, you learn from the source. So this is Paul Rothamond, and he is um, the, uh, he's, his title actually is DNA Origamist. And he has, he, um, in this um, wonderful TED talk that he gave, he um, talks about how he creates shapes with DNA. And what he does is he uses um, uh, different, I believe, amino acids and, and our knowledge of, um, our, of DNA uh, to create shapes with, with, that are you know, shapes of boxes or stars or smiley faces. So he, it's, it's absolutely fabulous, like having him in the classroom. So this is, this is the new way of learning, is, is in my opinion, um, to, to go to, these are like um, what we want to call uh, um, um, original sources, right? Primary sources. So, um, the other challenge, the last challenge I wanted to bring up to you is the fact that um, the scientific literature is beyond the student level. And this actually is an issue, but um, uh, what they do is they use current articles and non-scientific publications to bridge the gap. So, um, the New York Times and Scientific American and um, anything that's posted on, on nano work. Um, I'm on Twitter and I follow every nano um, uh, you know, publisher that I can, and things that come up, I email them to myself, and then I incorporate them into the class. So these are this is actually where I start. Um, I did challenge students to do real research in academic literature, and um, while that was a challenge, certainly a challenge for them, and I had to help them understand, and um, not everybody did understand what they were reading, they're still exposed to it, which is more than I can say for the students in my physics class. Um, uh, in addition, uh, that we did, they read this through their participation. I gave them a choice. They could, they could, partic they could participate in the Ex Toshiba's Explorer Vision um, Award program, the, the competition, or the Generation Nano competition. And um, uh, they all chose one or the other. They were all reading research in academic literature. And we, we came away with an honorable mention award in um, this past year for the Explorer Vision. So that was really something that the students were very proud of. Um, and um, uh, they were one of the groups that was successful in, in being able to read academic literature. So that was, um, it was worth it to challenge them because, you know, while not everyone got something out of it, um, some of them really, truly did. So here's, here's the other thing is that because we're, we're, we're li um, not using a textbook, what we're doing is we're following up on the current research. Now, this article I came across um, from the World Economic Forum um, while we were doing quantum computer program, uh, excuse me, uh, unit. And um, last year when I taught it, they, this was, it was all still theory and it was just kind of, uh, you know, um, behind the curtain and they're coming up with something and D-Wave is working on this. And, um, and this year, it turns out that I, um, Google has put, IBM's got a, a computer and um, Google has a computer and they've put, um, they've made, they're making it accessible so that you can actually um, write a program for it and, it can, and, and upload it to the cloud and uh, they'll run it on this computer. The, the, the speed with which these innovations are happening is staggering and so um, it's, that's the nature of the course, that's the nature of teaching nanotechnology, is that it's going to be different every year because every year there are more things that have happened and, um, and that's what makes it exciting. So it's, it's a really a matter of embracing the fact that it's, it's a moving target rather than struggling with it. So these are my best resources for teaching nano that I have found. Um, I've, got, I've got probably 20 times this, but these are the ones that I go to. These are my go-to sources. So um, um, NNIN has the best um, collection of nano um, uh, labs. Uh, University of Wisconsin, Mersec, 
uh, has a, has another fabulous. And then I didn't even put on their Tri Nano because that's kind of new, and I haven't really used any of them yet. But you know, there's the Tri Engineering website, and there's also a Tri Nano website. Um, the two books that the three books that I go to are Big Ideas of the Nano Scale Science of Nano Scale Science and Engineering. That's the one that I had the cover picture of that I that has the nine big ideas. Nano Scale Science Activities for grades six to twelve. Um, this NSDA Press has. Tremend I've got, I use so many of them, many of these activities, and they're really wonderful. Um, they're, they're on the more basic side, whereas the ones that you're going to find from the University of Wisconsin and from NNI uh, are more, um, they're more really chemistry labs and more complicated labs. But these are really wonderful for, um, you know, things you can do with paper and things you can do with cardboard and things that you can do with water and color, food coloring. Um, and then uh, Nanotechnology, A Dental Introduction to the Next Big Idea. That is not a textbook, but it is a wonderful resource. And I would say I definitely use, I think, at least the first two chapters for the students to read um, because it does such a nice job of, um, of explaining um, really why this is such a big deal, why it's such an important thing. So in closing, um, I find that teaching nanoscience is an easy way to interest and excite the students. Um, about science. Um, I am delivering uh, innovative con content from a variety of sources, so not just, I, I, one of the strengths of the class I think is the fact that, this, that there are so many different sources from which I am drawing um, material. It's a necessary part because there is not a textbook. And um, and I do find that my blended classroom environment works best for me. And by blended, what I'm what I mean is um, they've got computers, and they're doing um, quite a bit of their of their um, research, and the content is delivered through, um, as I said, like Paul Rothman through the um, through the, the people that are actually doing the research. And so um, they're doing a tremendous amount of online. You know, um, searches and and research and reading, and then I and then videos, and then I um, enrich that with in class experiments and the design projects. And um, just wanted to mention that I am running an nanoscience science workshop for middle and high school teachers at Stevens Institute of Technology this summer. It is full, but we're going to be running it again next summer, um, and um, hopefully um, with more NSF funding, we'll just keep we'll keep running them. So that's um, those are places, and I have seen around the country every now and then. There was one up in um, Massachusetts. There was one, I think, in Minnesota. There's somebody in Minnesota who does it. So occasionally, you do find that nano science workshops do crop up, and that's another really wonderful place to get as much exposure as you can to nano science if you're thinking about teaching it. So um, I just want to say thank you. Um, here is my email. There is my blog, and this is my Twitter handle. And I am going to be um, part of the network um, that um, Quinn is going to tell you about in a couple of minutes, and um, so that you can absolutely get in touch with me in any of these ways. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to um, Quinn and uh, and stop my sharing. Thank you very much, Marielle. I certainly enjoyed your presentation, and we've gotten a couple of questions from the through Google and also through email. So I wanted to start with one that actually was talking about uh, virtual labs, and if you've used any, for example, the virtual nano lab at UVA, or if you've had any experience with virtual labs with your classroom. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I have actually um, this year for the first time I used the NAC. Network Virtual Lab at um, at Penn State, and um, it was very interesting because uh, the we I didn't actually send our gold nanoparticles there. We used their samples, and um, we were on with them for the entire 80 minute period. And I was actually very concerned because uh, I thought, oh, this is going to be dry, and the kids aren't going to be really interested in this. And I wonder what he's going to talk about. And they were riveted. They loved it. So it was really a wonderful experience, and I absolutely recommend that um, uh, we do that going forward, that anybody does that. Great. Uh, thank you. And it's NAC at Penn State. And I just wanted to point out to everybody that this 
will be archived and available afterwards, so you'll be able to go back and look at all of those resources that Marielle has mentioned and also the audio. So all of this great stuff you'll be able to go back to and revisit afterwards. Um, and then we've got a question that actually has to do with your comments at the beginning about being focused on job training since you're working with high schoolers. And they're wondering if you focus it primarily to your local area, Morristown, and the kind of jobs that might be available there, or if you broaden it and if you touch any on, you mentioned um, the 2 million jobs by 2020, if you talk to the students about the, the levels of education that they might want uh, or need, uh, for example, perhaps just community college level or up to a PhD, how, how specific do you get when you talk about um, job preparedness in your class? Um, I actually, I could do more, um, do more uh, actual uh, training, or, or rather, um, I could do more communication in terms of specific jobs. Um, really, what the students that I am dealing with, um, for the most part, are college bound, and so my um, my my the arc of the class is to take the um, uh, students and get them excited about and interested in taking science classes and chemistry classes that will help them move toward this type of. Um, a career, but um, I think that's a very good point, and I think that I could um, work more closely with the um, with the with some of the county colleges or the community colleges. Um, I do know that uh, NanoLink is some place is is a, an organization in mm, I think it's Minnesota, and they work with county the county colleges. They actually provide curriculum online for, for the college level um, to prepare people actually to go and operate types of machinery like SEM and TEM. So that's something that um, I think there's a, an absolute need for. Um, I don't have, um, I don't, um, I, I almost feel that that's um, a, something that the community colleges and the college level is something that they would be doing, um, but I could definitely probably incorporate more of them to my classroom as well. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is more, I suppose, about outcomes and um, I don't believe you mentioned, but how long you've been teaching the nanoscience class, for how many years? And the question was about, um, since you mentioned using it for 10th graders, if you've been able to measure, seen any kind of uh, perhaps effect or on, on their future, their outcomes in, future, in their later science courses, junior, senior years, if the students who are taking your nanoscience class are more likely to take more science classes, if there's, have you had a chance to look at any long-term effects of this class with your students? That's a great question. Um, well, I've only been teaching it for two years. Um, I do have, I have had in both years a good number of seniors, and I haven't pursued what they are doing at the at the college level, and that's something that maybe I might want to consider doing. Um, I uh, will say that the that the um, we have a lot of a science electives in in our school, so um, whether students would take them because they've been involved in nanoscience or not, I'm not sure that there's going to be a causality there, even if they are taking additional classes. Um, because we have so many, and nanoscience is different from the other science electives that we have. So I'm not entirely sure whether, whether I don't, I don't know that there's a path that would that would indicate causality. Um, but I will say this: um, after the uh, Explorer Vision participation that my student, one, that um, one group of students um, had, um, he's already preparing next year's um, entry which he would not have known about otherwise. So I'm um, very pleased about that. And so that, that actually has moved him more toward chemistry and really chemical engineering, um, uh, neurochemistry, actually, neurobiology and chemistry as a combination, which he didn't really think about before. He was really just doing biology. And now he sees the combination of the chemistry because, um, yeah, I, I, his, his, his was on, um, his research was on, uh, carbon nanotubes, single wall carbon nanotubes, um, and 
the fact that neurons can be grown on them. So he's fascinated now with this, and the fact that um, there's you know, it helped. It has helped him see the um, the link between physics, chemistry, and biology, which he didn't see before. So um, as far as taking classes, I don't know, but he's definitely going to be participating in the challenge going forward. And I think, at least in his case, it has changed his trajectory. I loved hearing all of that. Uh, I also want to give a plug for Generation Nano should be happening again in the fall, so that's another option for your students. But to hear that a, a student got excited because of being able to take part of a, a challenge is really great. Um, the next question is coming from the, the Google Plus, actually. And it's a question about uh, talking about safety and safety cer certification. And um, for example, they mentioned in robotics that they teach one of the first activities is safety certification. Uh, do you do anything like that? Do you take the kids perhaps to visit a clean room? Uh, anything to kind of prepare them for the safety issues of working with nano in the lab? OK, well, I would like to be clear. We don't actually, I mean, we make gold nanoparticles, but everything else that we do is a model or a simulation at the macro scale for things that happen on the nano scale. So, you know, we could make graphene oxide in the classroom. We could absolutely do that um, because that's something that doesn't require the, the, the type of equipment that graphene um, is the, that you need to make graphene. So graphene is very hard to make. Graphene oxide is easy to make and we could make it, um, but we don't. And the reason why we don't is um, it's, a, it's a kind of a sludgy black mixture that could be anything. So unless you have an SEM or a, an AFM and you can look at it on that scale, you really aren't seeing you're really not seeing the, the the nano properties of it. So we use graphite, which is something that I can use in the in the classroom. So because of that, um, there are no uh, there are no clean room procedures, or there there's not there are no special handling of nano nano composite procedures required because it's really just a chemistry classroom. Um, having said that, um, I do bring my students, I have for the past two years, brought my students down to uh, University of Pennsylvania because they have a nano day every year and they walk us through. One of the things they do, they don't walk us through the clean room obviously, but they've got a fabulous new building and the wall, the front wall of the clean room is glass. And so you can see everybody in the bunny suits working. And we get to see an SEM and an AFM and a TEM all in operation and the um, fluorescence microscopy, uh, microscope, all of that in operation. And that is a fabulous trip. Um, so that is something that, um, that they do get exposure to. But then it's just really a, a regular chemistry classroom um, at the high school level. Thank you uh, for that answer, and I just wanted to point out that on the nano.gov website, on the public webinars tab, there's actually, we the office did a pre earlier webinar on nano lab safety geared towards um, training the next generation of scientists. So if anybody is interested in, in that, they should check it out on the nano.gov slash public webinars page. There's a tab to it, and, and it is also archived. So a couple of the... Um, questions that we have, I feel like you sort of addressed during your presentation, but maybe you'll want to say a little more. And I'm kind of excited about this one simply because that quote from Niels Bohr that you mentioned is one of my favorite as a physicist. Uh, I think it's hilarious, and I'm, I'm very glad when everybody mentions it. But there were some questions about um, if you felt the students particularly struggle when you're discussing quantum effects, if that might be a, a section that perhaps uh, discourages them, I guess, is the way they're trying to say it. Um, and if, if that section might, I, I guess, also how long do you spend on that if you feel that that's a section that uh, has benefit, more benefits or enough benefits for perhaps the difficulty of it is sort of the, the theme of the question. Okay, that's a great question as well. Um, so I don't teach them quantum mechanics. I it's quantum mechanics I absolutely find so fascinating and, and I'm, I'm a student of it. Um, having been an engineer, I never 
learned any of that in college. I was all in the application courses. Um, and so now I find myself studying it. Um, I don't teach them how things behave on the quantum level. My goal for them in this class is to be conversant and fluent in the language of, um, of science research and in nanoscience. So what I, my, what I want for them is to be able to explain why Moore's law is coming to an end and why they and how quantum computers work. In fact, for my capstone core, my capstone um, project, I had them. I don't know if you've seen this, but um, so in other, so to answer your question, they don't. They're not frustrated by it because I'm not teaching it at the level at which they will be frustrated by it. Um, perhaps in future years I will be. But um, if anyone has seen the um, Oh God, what's his name? The um, the Prime Minister of Canada um, just was asked in a in a um, in a press meeting um, about how quantum computers work, and he answered them, and it's absolutely hilarious. And it's just a little clip; it's a minute and a half long. And um, so that was my capstone. I said, "You're going to have to take." five different areas that we've studied in or, and even the ones that we haven't studied because there are so many more areas that we didn't have time for during the course of the, the year. Here are these five. Explain them in the same way that he did and videotape yourself doing it. So um, they had to pretend they were at a press release. They didn't I wound up having to attend a conference and I wasn't there. So that so the, the the videos are not I was hoping to share some of the videos with you, but they're not good quality. So next year they will be. Um, but I wanted them to explain in a very clear, concise way what the, what quantum computers are or um, why gold nanoparticles are red at the nanoscale because that's plasma, um, plas surface plasma on resonance. Um, explain that, you know, so that somebody who's uh, not a physicist or not a nanoscientist can understand it. That's the goal. So, um, so we don't get into the quantum, but I think that um, I don't think that's the goal of it. I think the goal is for them to be able to to understand it well enough. And and to be honest, um, uh, scanning tunneling microscopes are are still. I mean, I just I could explain what what I've been taught, but I still really truly don't understand how that works. So I'm still a student of it as well. And um, and I don't find that there's frustration with it. I find that when I focus on um, language and, and communication and fluency, um, there really is never any frustration when it comes to that. I just want to say that I wish you had been my high school teacher <laughs> about all of this, um, especially the idea of having these kids practice at the level of a press conference and having them record themselves is really valuable just for the communication skills. And I, I think the Prime Minister is Trudeau, and I'm going to look up that. Yeah, that's his name. Thank you. It's you know, to learn to see to see how he does. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Um, another question that we had, and you sort of already answered this, was um, if you've ever tried anything like a a journal club for nanotechnology, and you did mention that you have your students do actively doing research um, throughout. So if you have any, do you um, perhaps uh, you could expand on that maybe, and, and I'm kind of curious how you equip them to uh, to add on to this question, how you equip them to know quality sources, I guess, like to, to trust that they're not just going to Wikipedia and, and, and how they know, because the, the ones that you listed during your talk, for example, the New York Times and Scientific America, do you, or American, do you, do you tell them that those are good areas or have they discovered it? I'm just curious how they've learned to do the research part of it. Well, we've got a really wonderful um, uh, staff at Morristown High School, and so through their their um, their work in English, they have they have been taught consistently how to do research. I actually, interestingly, um, when it comes to science and when it comes to to, to nanoscience, um, Wikipedia is I find to be a very credible source. And the rest of the world doesn't use Wikipedia for much, but I, for, as far as science goes, scientists are all over that. And if there's something that's not right, 
it's changed. And for years I've been saying that. But um, in addition to that, um, we have really wonderful media specialists that work that work with me. Um, for the most part, um, if it comes from a university or if, if it has sources, you know, I help them vet what's good and what's not. Um, so we don't really ever come up, but we actually they have. Um, for example, if you look at silver and gold nanoparticles, there is. Um, this is actually a good example of that. You know, the 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 New York Times. It's obvious. It's an obvious. It's a good source. Um, Scientific American. It's another good source. Um, but when I had them look up silver and gold nanoparticles, and the fact that you know, for example, silver silver is anti antibacterial. Um, when they Google these things, uh, what comes up are all of these websites that are made by these grassroots organizations of people who are um, they are uh, promoting the health benefits, and so they have all this fake journalism in there and these fake sources. And I do. I mean, what I do is I, you know, as as they go through it, this is like a one-off basis. I'm just saying, I, I don't know what this is. I don't know who they are. Um, this is not credible. So there there are areas in which we research where that doesn't come up at all, like quantum computing. That doesn't come up at all because nobody's. Nobody can, wants to touch that except for the people who know about it. And then in other areas, we find that there are all. I find that there are all of this this mess, and I just kind of point it out and laugh at it and say, okay, that's not a good source, and these are the reasons why. So, but I work closely with the media specialists in the library because they're the experts on how this works. And I'm also working to get them, and I have to do this myself. Um, I'm working to get them to source everything which they're still not in the habit of doing and um, I find that I even do it. I take pictures and photographs from places and then I forget to source them. It's very hard but you know the way to teach them is to model it. So I'm getting to the point where I'm having them put sources of, from everything for everything that they do. So, um, so working with the other staff in, this, in the school is really the best way to do it. We have a culture of that. Great, thank you. So we are out of time. So um, I want to thank you again, Marielle, for a great presentation. I made so many comments while you were um, speaking, and I, I'm going to touch base with you again about Prey. I want to talk about science fiction and uh, nanotechnology with you. I want to just repeat to everybody who's watching that, as I said, this is going to be archived and available on YouTube. It'll be Nanotube, which is the National Nanotechnology Initiative's official YouTube channel. And you can look back at the nano.gov slash public webinars. Is when, once it's archived, that's where the link will be. And I want to reiterate that this was a part of the Teaching Nano Emerging Technologies Network, that this webinar and, and future webinars are going to be a, a, hoping to be a vehicle to help teachers talk to one another. And we want this conversation to continue beyond these webinars. So if you're interested in joining the network, please email nanoed at nnco.nano.gov, nanoed at nnco.nano.gov, so we can, we just want to help facilitate, the, the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office wants to help facilitate teachers so you can talk to one another, and Marielle has been uh, very active in trying to get everybody to talk to each other, and we're very grateful that she volunteered to give this first webinar, so please join the conversation and learn from each other uh, how to teach nano and uh, nano and emerging technologies in the classroom. And with that, I just want to thank Marielle again and thank all of you for joining us. And uh, have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>